Hello, my name is Sanakt, and today I'm going to be explaining how to play narrative battles in the Crusade mode of Warhammer 40,000. Within this, I'm going to be explaining the pre-battle setup that will need to occur, including agendas. I will then go through a brief example of a narrative battle, including two example Crusade armies. And then afterwards, I will be talking about the post-battle bookkeeping, including experience and battle scars. So many people who go to play Crusade mode have already played multiple games of matched play in Warhammer. So some of the main differences between matched play and narrative play are instead of selecting secondary objectives, you will instead select agendas although they work in a very similar way. As well, there is usually a less symmetrical gameplay, as it's more about the narrative than it is about being perfectly fair and even. Furthermore, there's generally a lot more bookkeeping involved in narrative play as opposed to matched play. So throughout this, I'm going to be covering an example battle, which will be a combat patrol, or 500 points, of Death Guard against Necrons. Any text in blue will refer to this example. So as with match play, the first step of a narrative battle is to muster your army. So the players will need to create a crusade army of the agreed battle size using the units from their crusade force. If the unit isn't in your crusade force, you cannot include it in your crusade army. It will need to be battle forged, and this means that if you are playing a combat patrol mission, you will need to use only a patrol detachment unless you are playing either Imperial Knights or Chaos Knights, in which case you can only include one super heavy detachment. You must include complete units, as in, for example, if you have a 10 model Dire Avenger unit in your Crusade Force, you have to take all 10 of them. If you're going to bring them, you can't take only 5 of them. In addition, you will have to make a note of the total crusade points that your units have, and this is your army's total crusade points. Furthermore, you cannot make use of any pre-battle upgrade stratagems such as relics or warlord traits, as these must be purchased with requisition points beforehand. So here we have the first example army, the Death Guard army, which is 500 points. So I won't go through everything, but in effect, we have a Lord of Contagion with a Relic and Warlord trait. We have seven Plague Marines with an assortment of various ranged and melee weapons. We have three Death Shroud Terminators. The champion has been given a Relic through the use of the Specialist Reinforcement Stratagem. And we then have a Chaos Spawn, who I have named Karen. And lastly, we have 10 Pox Walkers. Because we have a Relic, a Warlord trait, and then a Specialist Reinforcements upgrade throughout the entire 500 point army, the total Crusade points is 3. It is worth noting, Pox Walkers do not gain experience points. More on that later. On to our second example army, we have 495 points of Necrons. So we have an Overlord leading this detachment who has a Relic and a Warlord trait, and they have the Specialist Reinforcement upgrade to have the Hand of the Faerun upgrade. There are then two squads of 10 Necron Warriors, 10 with Flayers and 10 with Reapers, and then four Scorpac Destroyers. All of the upgrades on the Overlord will add Crusade points, and because Hand of the Phaeron, which was purchased with the Specialist Reinforcements requisition, because that stratagem would cost two command points, we have to add two Crusade points, meaning that the total of the Necron's army is four Crusade points. Once both players have mustered their armies, they will then need to compare their total Crusade points. The player with less Crusade points will receive extra Command points equal to half of the difference in Crusade points rounded up. This is to take account for the fact that whoever has more Crusade points will have more upgrades within their army, so the extra Command points will be given to the other player to try and balance that out. So for example, the Death Guard army has three Crusade points, while the Necron army has four Crusade points. 
Since the Death Guard army has one Crusade point less, they will receive half of that rounded up, which is one extra command point. Once both players have compared their Crusade points, they will need to determine the mission. So for this example, the mission will be sweep and clear from the core rulebook for the Crusade mission pack. So players will alternate placing four objectives on the battlefield, two of which have to be in the center and one has to be in each deployment zone. At the start of the second and subsequent command phases, players will score 10 victory points per objective they control. And if a player controls an objective in their command phase, they can keep controlling it even if they move off of it until their opponent takes it off of them. Once the mission has been determined, each player will select their agendas. Agendas work like secondaries, but they do not score you victory points, they instead allow your units to gain experience points. The number of agendas you can select depends upon the battle size. For example, in a combat patrol, you would only be able to select one agenda. There are many agendas in the core rules, and all of the 9th edition codices have their own unique agendas, but you can only take a maximum of one agenda from each category. Example agendas include Assassins, which gives a unit two experience points for each character they kill, and Reaper, which means that the unit which destroyed the most enemy units gets two experience points. Experience points are used to track a unit's progression, which is kept track of on that unit's Crusade card. Every unit will start with zero experience points, but will gain them by participating in battles or accomplishing certain tasks, with some requisitions, depending on the faction, also able to award experience points. Every certain number of experience points, a unit will gain a rank, as shown in the table below. Named characters, swarm units, such as Canoptic Scarab Swarms, any summoned units, and fortification units are unable to gain experience points, along with some other units specified on their data sheet, such as poxwalkers. So because the example battle is taking place at, as a combat patrol battle size, each of the armies is only able to select one agenda. So the Death Guard will select Survivor, which they are going to select their Death Shroud Terminators for, meaning that if that unit survives the battle, they will get a number of experience points. In addition, the Necrons will select Territorial Imperative, a Necron-specific agenda in which they gain experience points for destroying enemy units that are on an objective or for completing an action on an objective marker. So after agendas have been selected, the rest of the battle itself takes place very similarly to matched play. So in this case, attacker and defender roll-off has already occurred, deployment zones have been selected with deployment taking place, the Necrons have selected their command protocols, and then they have also won the first turn roll-off. So the Necrons go first, and their first turn is fairly unproductive, being unable to get in shooting range, but they do move up. The Death Guard do very little in shooting as well, but the Plague Marines do make a lucky 11-inch charge into one squad of Necron Warriors, but only kill a few of them. And as scoring only happens in the second battle round, neither side has scored yet. At the start of the second battle round, the Necrons score 20 victory points for holding two objectives. The Scorpec Destroyers and the Overlord charge the Plague Marines, killing five of the seven, although the Overlord suffers two wounds and one of the Scorpec Destroyers is taken down by the Plague Marines. The Necron Warriors with Gauss Flayers complete the Territorial Imperative action on one of the objectives, meaning they will gain experience at the end of the battle. The Death Guard score 20 victory points for holding two objectives as well. And while the Death Shroud Terminators do arrive from Teleport Strike, they fail their charge. The Poxwalkers charge one group of warriors, and the Chaos Spawn charges the Overlord, but both do very little damage. The Overlord kills the Chaos Spawn, and the Scorpec Destroyers finish off the surviving Plague Marines. The Necrons have begun to establish board control, scoring 30 victory points for holding three objectives at the start of the third battle round. 
Uh, one squad of warriors is locked in combat, but slowly whistling down the poxwalkers. But despite the Overlord and three Scorpac destroyers charging the Lord of Contagion, the Lord of Contagion rolls really well on their saves and only loses two wounds, and in return manages to destroy all of the Scorpac destroyers. Onto the Death Guard turn, they only hold one objective, so they will only score 10 points. The Death Shroud Terminators finally make their charge into one squad of warriors, killing eight of the nine, but half of the squad then reanimates, meaning that the objective is now contested. The Lord of Contagion takes no damage from the Overlord, rolling really well on their saves, and then kills the Overlord when the Overlord fails one too many saves. On the fourth battle round, the Necrons only hold a singular objective, and with their command protocols still active, one squad of warriors can fall back and shoot, trying to kill the two surviving Poxhawkers, but fails to do any damage, with the other squad of warriors slowly taking wounds away from the Lord of Contagion, but that is it for their fourth turn. The Death Guard now have board control, holding three of the objectives and scoring 30 victory points, and between the Death Shroud killing one squad of warriors and the Lord of Contagion charging and killing the other squad, the Necrons have now been tabled. As they still hold a single objective, the Necrons do score 10 victory points on their fifth turn, and the Death Guard then score 30 more victory points for controlling three objectives on their turn. At the end of the game, the score is 100 to 80, including Painted, leading to a Death Guard victory. Now that the battle has been completed, there are five steps which need to occur in the bookkeeping section of the narrative play battles. The first of these is to take out of action tests for any units that were destroyed. The second is to update the experience points of all of your units. The third is to determine any battle honors. The fourth is to update any units combat tallies. And the fifth is to update your order of battle. If a unit was destroyed in the battle, it will need to take an out of action test. To do so, roll a single d6. On a 2+, plus, that out of action test is passed, but if you roll a 1, the test is failed, and the unit must either suffer a battle scar or a devastating blow of your choosing. If it suffers a battle scar, it will gain a negative effect for future battles. This can either be picked from a list or rolled from that list. In either case, you will need to subtract 1 from that unit's crusade points, to consider the fact that it's now less effective. If it takes a devastating blow, it cannot gain any experience points from the battle it just participated in, and also loses d6 experience points. Note that if this would cause it to go down a rank, it does not lose any battle honors associated with that rank, but it will not gain any battle honors for reattaining that same rank. Named characters, swarms, Summoned units and fortifications do not need to take out of action tests. From our example battle, only two of the Death Guard's units, the Plague Marines and the Chaos Spawn, were destroyed, but as can be seen here, both of them passed their out of action tests. The Necrons were not so fortunate, as all of their units were destroyed. And while both squads of Necron Warriors and the Scorpec Destroyers passed their out of action tests, the Overlord did not and they are taking a battle scar, which in this case is a lost leg, which means that they lose one inch of movement and they have to subtract one from their advance and charge rolls. Units can gain experience points after a battle from various sources. Every unit that participated automatically gains one experience point, regardless of its performance in the battle. Every third unit a unit destroys, allows it to gain one experience points. Note that this is cumulative over multiple battles, so if it destroys two units in one battle and then destroys one unit in the next battle, that's a total of three units, so it will gain one experience point. If a unit completes an agenda, it may gain experience points for that. And in addition, each player can select one of their units to be marked for greatness, and that unit will gain three experience points. Furthermore, the mission may have a victor's bonus, which can award further experience points. So we're now going to go through our example battle and update the experience of each of the units involved. For the purposes of explaining how battle honors will work shortly after, we're going to assume every unit began the battle with four experience points. Maybe it had participated in a battle previously. 
The Lord of Contagion gains one experience point per participation, and because it killed three units in that battle, it gains another experience point, so it will now have six. The Plague Marines gain an experience point for participation, but nothing else, meaning they now have five. Poxwalkers don't gain experience at all. The Death Shroud Terminators gain one experience point for participation. They completed their survivor agenda and got four experience points for that. And they also were marked for greatness, so they gain another three experience points. And while they did kill one unit, and that doesn't award any experience points now, it will award experience points in future battles if they kill more units. Between all of these, the Death Shroud Terminators now have 12 experience points. Additionally, the Chaos Spawn gained one experience point for participation, so it now has five experience points. The Victor's bonus for this mission allowed a second unit to be marked for greatness, which has been given to the Lord of Contagion, meaning that the Lord of Contagion gains three more experience for a total of nine. So for the purpose of explaining rules as well, we're going to assume that all of the Necron units began the battle with four experience points as well. The Overlord gained one experience point for participation, meaning they now have five, and they also killed one unit, which means that if in a future battle they kill two more units, they will then gain an experience point. The Necron Warriors with Gauss Flayers gained one experience point for participation, and another experience point for completing an agenda, meaning they now have six experience points. The Necron Warriors with Gauss Reapers gained an experience point for participation, meaning they now have five experience points, and the Scorpec Destroyers gain one experience point for participation, another for completing an agenda, and then they get three more experience points for being marked for greatness. And they also killed one unit, which will be important in future battles. Between all of this, the Scorpec Destroyers now have nine experience points. Once you have determined the experience points gained by every unit, you will need to determine battle honors for any units that gained a rank due to experience, those units will gain a battle honor. Every time a unit gains a battle honor, you have to add one to its crusade points, or if the unit has 11 plus power rating, you will need to add two instead. There are four main types of battle honors, although some factions might have a unique type of battle honor in their crusade rules. In most cases, you can either pick the battle honor or you can roll for it. Battle traits are available to all units, and are helpful buffs to a unit, such as a 6 plus feel no pain, or an extra inch of movement. Weapon enhancements allow you to select a single weapon in that unit. If the unit has a champion, you have to select one of their weapons, and you can't do this to a relic. That weapon can gain one enhancement, such as an extra 6 inches of range, or an extra point of damage. Titanic units can only select some of the options, and if a unit is neither a character, vehicle, or monster, it can take a second enhancement on that weapon without having to acquire another battle honor, provided that one of those two options is from a more selective group. The third type of battle honor are Psychic Fortitudes, which are only available to Psychers and provide a useful buff to their Psychic abilities, such as an extra cast or an extra deny. Crusade Relics are limited to characters, and provide a useful upgrade, such as adding one to their armor save. The same character can take multiple Crusade Relics, and you're even allowed to take a Relic and a Crusade Relic, but each of the Crusade Relics in your army must be unique. We're now going to go through our example battle and give each of the units that gained a rank a battle. Starting with the Lord of Contagion, they are going to gain a Crusade Relic, a friends on injector. This allows them to reroll their advance rolls and their charge rolls, and gives them an extra attack if they charged, were charged, or heroic intervened. The Death Shroud Terminators also gained a rank. They're going to gain the Headhunter's Battle Trait, which means that they get plus one to hit and wound against any characters. The Necron Warriors with Gauss Flayers gained a rank as well. They're going to get the battle trait Undying Revenance, which is unique to the Necrons, which means that they can automatically pass one of their reanimation protocols each time the unit is attacked. The Scorpec Destroyers are the last unit to have gained a rank, and they're going to get a weapon enhancement, getting Heirloom and Finely Balanced on one of the squad's Hyperphase Threshers, giving a plus one to hit and exploding sixes to hit as well. So the last two steps of the bookkeeping include updating combat tallies and your order of battle. 
So for each unit that participated, you add one to that unit's battles played tally, and then you also add one to that unit's battle survived tally if it survived. If your units have any other tallies that need to be adjusted, adjust those as needed. On your order of battle, you increase the number of battles played by one, and you gain one requisition point, win or loss. You can also add or remove units from your order of battle, spend requisition points, or update anything else you need to prior to your next battle. For example, the Necrons spend one requisition point on repair and recuperate to remove the battle scar from their overlord. So here we have an example of an updated Crusade card after a narrative battle has been played. In this example, we have the Death Shroud Terminators that we used in our example battle. So what has changed is they have gained experience points, so that has now been kept track of at the top right. In the center, their battles played has gone from 1 to 2, and their battle survived is now 1. They destroyed one enemy unit, and they destroyed that with a melee weapon. They have now attained the blooded rank, as shown at the bottom, and their battle honor is headhunters. At the top right, because they have now gained a battle honor in addition to their relic, they now have two crusade points instead of only one. So in summary, a narrative battle will include mustering your crusade army, comparing the crusade points of yours and your opponent's army, selecting agendas, completing the battle, rolling any out of action tests, updating your experience, determining any battle honors, and then updating combat tallies in your order of battle. I hope that this has been helpful, and as always, happy crusading!